on this episode of China Unscripted. China is absolutely destroying the environment, and it affects everyone. The solution? Let China set their own environmental standards with absolutely no consequences for failing to meet them. Welcome to China Unscripted. I'm Chris Chappell. And I'm Matt Ganesta. And joining us today is Andrew Eil. He's the head of the Climate Risk for North America for Tata Consultancy Services. Andrew, thanks so much for being back on the show. Great to be here. So uh, the big annual climate conference, uh, COP28, just concluded in, in Dubai. It was held uh, this month. Uh, I'm curious, how, how did China shape the outcome? So China was and is always a big player in the climate space simply by virtue of being by far the largest greenhouse gas emitter in the world, has been for about 20 years since passing the United States. It's not the largest emitter historically. When you add up all the emissions since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, the U.S. is still pretty far ahead. Number one. But China's catching up fast. So what China does really matters. We can't solve the climate problem without China being a very active player. So it's always the elephant in the room. And on the one hand, it's very, it plays a very constructive role. On the other, it tends to not be as in the forefront as you might think. It tends to, I think, work more on the margins and in the background. I think the pre prevailing view amongst Chinese uh, diplomats, probably not incorrectly, is that by being the center of attention, you tend to get caught in the crosshairs. In other words, it's the opposite of, of um, all press is good press. Uh, on the contrary, no press is good press. If the world is not focused as much on China's role in contributing to net zero, to reducing emissions, then it's a, a good day for China's international reputation. So they do some things that are um, quite helpful and quite productive, and they are a constructive player. In, in what sense are they, like, what are, what are some of the things that are constructive that they're helping? In terms of constructive, well, this year, for the first time, they committed in a bilateral agreement right before the COP with the U.S. to bring down their methane emissions, uh, methane being the second most important greenhouse gas after carbon dioxide, and actually has an outsized impact on global warming over a shorter time frame. Carbon dioxide sticks around for, for centuries. Methane sticks around for about a decade. So, you know, you add up the impact and it's smaller than CO2, but if you can reduce methane emissions, the climate feels it a lot faster. So you can actually achieve more benefits in terms of, of bending the curve of greenhouse gas emissions and, and global warming if you can tackle these pollutants like methane. So it's really important. It's become a major global focus. It was one of the key plot lines of COP28. And uh, China joined the action um, substantively uh, for the first time. So that was really helpful. So, so China's not reducing methane. They're pledging to reduce methane. That's right, but that's also true for most of the rest of the world. And part of the um, the challenge of the climate diplomatic world is there's a lot of talk and not a lot of action. So even the ostensibly environmentally friendly countries are in many cases struggling mightily to re reduce their emissions. So while that's true of China, uh, they're not any more guilty of that than anyone else. And so what's... What's China's biggest source of methane emissions? I assume it's cow farts. Don't forget the burps too. Uh, the, the, the methane uh, farts and burps. The, you know the the anaerobic methane from that is is an important source. I you know China has many different sources. I would venture to guess that the largest source is actually coal mine methane, 
because, or coal bed methane, because that is one of the largest sources globally, but it's concentrated in those areas that have a lot of coal. It's probably not news to you that China has a ton of coal. So it just, it, methane, which is basically natural gas, often coexists in the same underground deposits as coal. So if you start digging up the coal, unless you're doing something special to capture and remove it, uh, the methane that is, you're going to wind up with a lot of vented methane to the atmosphere when you when you open up these underground seams. And so that is is likely a big one. But there are other sources as well. So from, from that perspective, like in order for China to reduce uh, methane tied to coal production, they basically have to greatly reduce coal production, which may or may not happen. There are some technical nuances there. Now, I'd be the first one to tell you that reducing coal consumption is a critical and urgent solution to the climate crisis. And China is by far the world's largest coal uh, producer and consumer. At the same time, it's not a perfect one-to-one -one relationship, how much coal you're consuming and how much coal mine methane you're, you're, you're producing, because you actually can capture the methane in most circumstances using specialized airflow and fans and vacuums and stuff like that. And you can collect it and either burn it off, which is known as flaring, or use it as a fuel because methane is, is uh, basically natural gas. It's the primary constituent of natu natural gas and it's highly flammable. In fact, often you have to remove the methane from coal mines because it is a, a flammability hazard. Whenever you're hearing about mine accidents that are explosions, it is almost always because the methane was not properly managed and removed, and there was some spark that caused the methane-infused air in the, in the coal mine to ignite. So it's actually a major safety issue, even besides this environmental issue. But you do need specialized equipment and regulations and attention and all these things and building infrastructure to do it properly. You also can get coal mine vented from old mine shafts or coal beds that have never been mined where it's just seeping out if there's some way that it can get to the surface. So in that sense, the coal production and the coal mine methane are not perfectly correlated, though obviously if they were leaving all their coal alone in the ground, you you wouldn't have nearly as much of a problem. It's Is that an expensive process? Because I know the Chinese economy is not doing well right now. So I kind of question whether the Chinese Communist Party would even bother to implement this agreement. It's a good question. Methane is a tricky issue in general. And we, uh, being, being the climate dork that I am, I could talk about methane all day long uh, <laughs> with regards to China and otherwise. But a quick note about methane is that a lot of it comes not only from coal, but from the oil and gas industry. Now, China is not a big, as big an oil and gas producer as many other countries, but it does have oil and gas. So that's another source of methane. The funny thing about the oil and gas industry is that despite the fact that they are literally letting their product go up in smoke if they are letting it leak, right? The natural gas that they're leaking is not just a pollutant, it is the product that they're selling most of the time. Uh, or it's a byproduct of the oil, but it's still something in theory that they could capture for a variety of reasons, from negligence to um, difficulty with managing infrastructure to uh, insufficient capital to uh, create the, the machinery that captures the methane, a lot of it is wasted or vented and, and leaked, even though if it were captured, they would be able to sell it and make money from it. So the, that's kind of the weird thing about this, that even though it, it is, you know, it's the proverbial $20 bill lying on the ground, 
The Economist says, well, it's not possible that it's real because someone would have picked it up. It actually is true that they are often losing money by not capturing these things, but you know, you don't see methane, you don't smell methane. If you're already making money anyway, maybe you're not paying that much attention to it. Maybe it's too much trouble. And so that often comes into play. Those factors can even be more important than the net cost because you might make more money from capturing it uh, than you you um, would be spending to to set up those systems, but it doesn't happen. And that's just often requires regulation to get done. And that was incidentally a big a big topic at at COP twenty eight. Well, how do you create that kind of regulation, especially internationally? Part of it is these international agreements, which it were front and center in Dubai. Part of it is just political will at the national or subnational level to put in these regulations. A big factor that, or a couple of big factors uh, that are now making a difference are there has been a lot of uh, moral pressure, um, activist attention, government pressure for oil and gas companies. I don't think that'll motivate the Chinese Communist Party, moral pressure. Fair enough. Um, a lot of the oil majors globally, uh, more of them private than nationally owned companies, which which um, tend to be you know much less imper- much more impervious to outside political pressure. People who who care about the climate, who are putting pressure on these companies and making them look bad if they're if they're not taking care of their methane, this is getting them to voluntarily pledge now to reduce their methane, whether they have to do it from a regulatory standpoint or not. They're basically trying to get ahead of the regulations and ahead of public opinion to show that they are constructive actors on climate change. And regardless of their motives, it is critical that it get done. So it is very important that this methane get captured and not leak to the environment where it is uh, a climate uh, global warming agent and incidentally also a pretty nasty air pollute if you're if you're living nearby. And so that's happening. These these uh, oil and gas companies are getting religion on the need to to capture their methane. So they're now kind of doing it themselves. The last factor that's important is. Scientific observation, uh, Earth observation, has advanced pretty dramatically in recent years, such that there are a lot of new satellites in Earth orbit that can actually detect and measure methane sources on the ground, such that no one can hide anymore, right? If you have some big oil field or some natural gas processing facility or pumping facility, if you are leaking a lot of methane, the satellite is going to see it in space. And so that is a bad headline waiting to happen. And that is another source of pressure now that, well, people who care about political pressure, companies that care about political pressure uh, now are having to contend with. Whether that's going to happen in China is is anyone's guess. So China didn't uh, take on any binding commitments for methane, which was a, a weaker commitment than other countries have made or other companies have made, where they've specifically said, we're going to reduce it by a specific amount by 2030. But it, it was it was a landmark in that China made this commitment for the first time. China does capture some of its methane from these sources. They've just never committed to meeting some performance standard and some objective yardstick. Didn't they also water down some of the language at COP28, like from phasing out fossil fuels to uh, transitioning away from? You are in with the lingo. You really uh, uh, know know the COP28 documents. I tip my hat. It It's, I think, a matter of some speculation which countries in the hallways of the of the negotiations were behind the watering down of that language on moving away from fossil fuels, and it was phase out or phase down. We wound up with with uh, transitioning from over time. I think the speculation is that was more due to the major 
oil and gas producers of OPEC. But it is equally true that fossil fuels includes coal, and China is the 800-pound gorilla on coal globally. So it is entirely possible. I confess that I don't have insider knowledge as to who was behind that political pressure, but it's entirely possible. Well, so speaking of of OPEC and you know Middle Eastern uh, oil, like COP twenty eight was held in Dubai, which is part of the UAE, and the United Arab Emirates is probably uses some of the highest per capita energy consumption of any country, and they got air conditioners running twenty four seven, for example. They're also a massive oil producer. Uh, that's how basically they made all their money. Um, I mean, Dubai has some other commercial investments that they funded with oil money, but it's essentially oil money. Like, is this just kind of like a sad irony? Is it, is it like almost just like that cynical joke? There's no question the optics were pretty lousy. And not only was the UAE the host, the uh, actual chairperson of the COP process this year and the host for the, the year or the coming year, is the one in charge of the process for the entire year leading up to it. So Sultan al-Jabber is his name. And, you know, wait for it. He is, he runs the national oil company, Adnoc, of the United Arab Emirates. So it basically made heads explode all over the world in climate circles, particularly people who are um, environment and climate hawks to uh, put the the fox in charge of the hen house, so to speak. Uh, I think there was a lot of question as to whether Sultan Al Jaber was a good faith actor, and I don't think that that was ever completely resolved. Again, optics are horrific. Um, that it's the oil companies calling the shots. That said you really kind of can't hide if you are baldly and blatantly catering to the oil interests and not getting a climate deal. You, it would have been pretty foolhardy for them to just do a pure power play because the, the, the diplomatic blowback would have been just uh, unbelievably ferocious. Right. So the ideal strategy then is to simply water things down as much as possible and still get an agreement that looks somewhat better than what there was before. That is entirely plausible. And reasonable reasonable people disagree about whether it was the UAE putting its thumb on the scale or whether that was simply just the political dynamics behind the negotiations with all the other players. I It's hard to say. We don't have a counterfactual. You know, if this had happened in... Costa Rica or some other environmentally friendly country, would we have gotten a different outcome? We'll never know. I will say that a lot of people have given uh, Sultan al Jaber credit for including fossil fuels in the final agreement, the global stock take at all, which to some people is a, a real accomplishment and demonstrates his bona fides. But it's also a low bar, though. <laughs> Well, I think there, yes, I, it's really interesting actually seeing what the environmental community has said in reaction to the agreement, because it really is a bit of a Rorschach test as to whether the observer believes that the UN international climate process is capable of achieving something and whether these incremental steps are leading us to a solution or just leading us off the cliff because we're not doing it. And, I, you know, there are a lot of environmentalists who actually have really praised the agreement for talking about the transition away from fossil fuels for the first time. That is unequivocally a, a shift that is arguably quite meaningful, but it was definitely watered down. And a lot of people also were crushed. And, you know, these, these quotes in The Guardian from climate scientists that they were devastated was the word that I read. So you know, different people had widely divergent reactions to the agreement, even within the environmental and, and, and climate community. Well, I think this is the big challenge when trying to address the climate crisis, the idea that 
you know, these oil companies and China in particular are responsible largely for what's happening. And yet they are in the position of power and any kind of effort to get them to do anything requires basically giving them what they want, which is usually to not change at all. Meanwhile, what ends up happening is like, you know, California will put a ban on gas vehicles by some date and then, you know, poor Americans who can't afford electric cars and can't afford $7 a gallon gas, they're the ones who get screwed. There's a reason that we haven't solved the climate problem. And the uncomfortable fact is it's not only because of the fossil fuel interests. Fossil fuels provide serve a function in society and everyone uses them and the availability of cheap and plentiful energy is useful to everybody and it's the lubricant of the economy and so it's a hard problem there is a lot of political skullduggery and actors whose hands are not clean but it's also true that we don't have fully cost-effective and abundant and reliable substitutes. And that's a big part of why we are where we are. There, of course, it's the, the global poor and vulnerable who are suffering the most and will continue to suffer the most from climate impacts. But it's also true that the global poor suffer from energy poverty. And unless we have a readily available affordable substitute, it's a really hard thing to, to look them in the face and say, we're helping you out by, by taking away your energy, right? So we, th these are hard issues and we have a lot of technology and a lot of it is available and that needs to be maximized, but it's not full, we don't have fully substitutable uh, clean options in every sector and for everyone in every part of the world. And that's, um, that's something we have to solve to address the problem. Well, and as it specifically relates to China, since China is uh, currently the largest emitter of greenhouse gases, how do you get them to do something to help the climate? Because they are, they are a sovereign country and they frankly don't care about international agreements. Uh, so how how can the international community actually get them to do something when they're holding this gun over everyone's heads? It's not just China. It's it's the entire UN system, right? The UN doesn't have an army. It can't enforce international law, and international law itself doesn't always cover a lot of these things. And that is the underlying dynamic. Uh, behind the difficulty of multilateral diplomacy to solve these environmental problems, which tend to be these tragedies of the commons, right? Where in the short term and in, in my locale, and for me personally, it's much easier to pollute and let other people deal with the consequences. And so that dynamic persists for every country, more or less. And when the climate community tried to impose binding, legally binding uh, targets on uh, countries for reducing emissions, back in the 90s, we got the Kyoto Protocol, which the U.S., resoundly rejected after Al Gore negotiated it. Uh, the U.S. Senate voted 95 to zero in, in, a, in a vote basically saying, we want no part of this. Uh, well, but and, the U.S. did lower emissions over the decades, whereas China, which I believe was in, did they sign the Kyoto Protocols? I can't remember if they did, well, but, so but anyways, did, they have not done anything. Yes, China did. But at the time in the Kyoto Protocol, all developing countries, including China, were completely absolved from any obligations to reduce their emissions. Uh -huh. So they were yeah, in a different well, I mean, category. They they didn't have to right. do anything at that time. So I mean, they they still put themselves in this category of a developing country, 
Yet at the same time, they, you know, they brag about these big shiny cities and they're they're the biggest being the uh, second largest economy. Second largest economy. Uh they've got, you know, more billionaires than almost any other country. Like, like they're not a developing country anymore. Yes, they have poverty, but every country has poverty, right? Dubai has poverty. Look at the people who were building all these skyscrapers. It's nonsense, right? It's a lie to say China's a developing country. And if China's not a developing country, and it's in fact closer to a developed country, then why should there be different standards for China? The one thing I would say is this binary division between developed and developing countries over the last 20 years has obscured more than it it's illuminated. You know, all the countries of the Middle East, uh, all the petrostates of the Gulf, who are among the richest countries in the world, are also technically classified as developing countries under that Kyoto framework. So it's really not that helpful a framework at all. Really, what you have are middle-income countries, and and they're determined not only by the um, GDP per capita alone, but also by levels of, of development and the strength of institutions and things like that. And, and I think China right, rightfully fits in the middle, um, both from the GDP standpoint and also according to those other metrics. I think what is clear and is reflected in the new, newer arrangement of the Paris Agreement, right? So Kyoto Protocol, 1994, 1995, that was a different world where you had the U.S., you had the post-Soviet countries, and then you had the so-called third world, right, which was presumed to be universally poor. That is not the world we live in anymore. Um, that was already acknowledged in 2015 in the Paris Agreement, where we still have this phraseology, common but differentiated uh, responsibilities that is meant to pay lip service to the fact that rich countries need to do more and poor countries don't need to do as much. Everyone kind of does what they can. But it removed that duality where only the rich countries reduce emissions and everyone else free rides. Now we have this world where everyone needs to reduce emissions, but they set their own targets. And it, it is not uh, legally binding in the sense that the UN will come punish you or someone will, there will be some consequences if you don't meet your targets. And that's part of the problem. The reason that approach was taken is because the other binding approach failed. The developing countries who are big emitters were completely excluded from any responsibility. The U.S. didn't sign on. But did lower its emissions because of pressure from the population. And even many of the countries that did sign on, like Australia, UK, um, uh, Canada, they they did not meet their targets, and so because the um, the binding approach to these climate negotiations uh, quite visibly failed, whether it was the the countries who were in or the countries who were out, no one reduced their emissions, and it didn't solve the problem. They switched to a different approach in in Paris in 2015 whereby countries advance their own targets and they kind of, they uh, self-validated, self-policed. The idea was you needed to be transparent. There would be peer pressure so that if you put forward a really weak emissions reduction target, uh, the court of public opinion um, and international diplomacy would, would punish you for it, but there was no binding mechanism. And that is the world that we, we live in. And because there is no enforcement mechanism, it really is either countries just doing it in their own interest or, or not doing it uh, at all in, in most cases. And that's really the challenge is, is how do you bring about this world where we actually have ambitious climate targets and we meet them? And there's no, really no way to, to push around a country like China and get them to do anything else than exactly what they want to do themselves. So I feel like the, the way things like I understand why they changed it, but but now the, the current idea is 
is everyone sets their own targets and there are no consequences for failing to meet them anyway, right? Like imagine applying that to like you work at a company as an employee and you set your own productivity targets. And even if you don't meet them, like there's no consequences. And so like, I feel like if you understand human nature at a basic level, you understand that this is going to fail. It's very hard to argue with your logic. Um, you're, if, if, if you get your bonus, whether you uh, get out of bed or not, then I think you're probably not going to show up for work. And that is climate diplomacy in a nutshell, I think one, one can say. Uh, well, oh, well, you brought up like uh, it's very hard to hold China accountable, right? Because they're, they're not they're not beholden to this public pressure in the same way. Well, yeah, they don't have a free country, so there's no way the Chinese population can push for greener technology the way that is happening now in the U.S. Right. And it's very difficult for the developed countries, even even like if the United States, let's say the Biden administration really, really wants to have China reduce its carbon and methane emissions. But like we're still doing business with them. Right. And. You know, China is now like, here's here's the irony. We're like Chi China's building all this like solar panels and wind turbines Big and electric EV vehicles, industry. right? I mean, like Chinese electric vehicles have exploded. I mean, in terms of quantity, possibly also individual cars have exploded, but like like all over Europe, uh, Australia, like all these Chinese EVs are everywhere, right? And Maybe it's only a matter of time before we see them in the U.S., although currently it's it's clearly Tesla dominating here. But but like with all this solar panels, wind turbines, electric vehicles, batteries that are, are being produced in China. Right. Like is I guess I guess my question is, well, are, are you saying that like China is powering this green energy industry with coal? So by using this, you know, the climate fear, they are able to create a market to sell their stuff that is powered by coal. So and with, you know, coal targets, they don't have to follow. So they're making money and still destroying the environment. And it's like it's not going anywhere. It, it's not untrue, but I think it's also important to recognize that other countries are doing similarly, meaning that lots of countries have fossil fuels representing a very, very large chunk of their power mix. And you talk about power intensive sectors like manufacturing, and it's going to have a carbon footprint. Now, that begs the question, should we not build all this stuff? Because even the building of it for the green economy is going to have a big carbon footprint. People have done the math, and I think in most cases, you still you still do that because we need to turn over our capital stock um, uh, so that ultimately we decarbonize as well, but then we have the green economy to go with it. But it's an important point that we can't pretend that building stuff for the new economy uh, the low carbon economy, the circular economy, environmentally friendly, does not itself have an environmental footprint. Well, it's not just at an environmental impact. It's, so, sorry, but it, it's, you know, if these EVs and solar panels were made in the United States, they would have a much greener, they would have a smaller carbon footprint, but that would also make them more expensive. So China manipulates, uh, you know, they, they can use coal for cheap, make all the stuff for cheaper, cut the Americans out of the market. And so then you don't get that advantage. The um, macroeconomic policy of the U.S. has changed pretty dramatically since about 2017, precisely to address those issues. Now, we have the broader trade issues, and then we have the climate-specific ones. And so maybe we can parse those out for a minute. Uh, the broader issues of subsidizing production for export and then dumping that production in export markets and bankrupting the local competition is a tactic that China engaged in for a long time and the world finally caught on to. 
And the real shift was around the time Donald Trump was elected president in 2016 and then took office in January 2017 and basically immediately declared a trade war on on China. Now, the irony is that despite all the flailing that he did and the, the, the bluster and some actions that were misplaced, it actually did align with a shift in broader policy thinking to recognize that China was abusing these global markets and measures were needed to protect against that. Trade measures, um, uh, investment in repowering local manufacturing and local supply chains, and that has actually been uh, turbocharged now, now under the Biden presidency. And the Inflation Reduction Act, which was the giant bill, um, uh, the value of which is somewhere between seven hundred billion and a trillion dollars, that was adopted in the summer of twenty twenty two. It includes a lot of these onshoring um, of supply chains and manufacturing for the green technologies that it's promoting. And so things like batteries only give the full subsidy to electric cars if they are made in the U.S. or or um, extracting um, critical minerals in the U.S. or in certain allied countries. And so that that is actually being tackled now. And there are a lot of trade issues around solar panels. And, and, and so it's, it's recognized that those are not fair tactics um, for global economic competition. And uh, they have bad consequences, right? I mean, the hollowing out of, of uh, middle America and manufacturing was due in, in no small measure to China's entry to the WTO. And so they only, that was only clear in retrospect in the Washington consensus of pure neoliberal trade um, really failed because it was being abused. I feel like I could have told you that in the 90s. <laughs> but but so that's and you're you making a been great right. point. But you're making a great point. This is a case where the U.S. can actually pressure China to commit to more green energy because, like you said, uh, with the, the the EV batteries things. Like if the U.S. is actually applying pressure to China rather than giving China things to, in the hopes that they will make some kind of, make good on their agreements. Uh, so maybe, maybe that is how we should be looking at this. What are some of the things the U.S. can do to put pressure on China to actually commit to tackling the climate crisis, which they have a big hand in? Great point. And I was a little glib when I said that the multilateral climate negotiations basically have no teeth, right? That is largely true, uh, but there are a few mechanisms for influencing countries, large and small. One is simply the moral suasion argument, right? That, you know, you're going to look bad um, in the jury of your peers if you don't take action on this, right? So there's there's no actual hard power mechanism. It's a soft power thing where you look bad and you lose prestige globally. And one can scoff at that, but I, I think that that's actually not negligible. It, it um, might not be a strong force, but it is a real force, right? It is, it's a factor. Pe- people care how they're perceived and, and it affects you know, your soft power and your influence globally. I think there's also the question of how everyone else reacts, right? Do we as a, as a global commu- community punish people, um, even reputationally, if they don't deliver on these commitments? And the answer right now is no, not really, right? You can be uh, Dubai and be, have a huge oil and gas industry and still host the COP and, and, be, and be lauded for it. So, so there's, there's that element. And then there are actual policy and diplomatic levers to try to uh, create some real consequences for non-action, right, or, or bad action. And those can include 
things like trade measures. So you might be, it, uh, you might face tariffs or not get certain uh, trade benefits if you don't uphold your part of the bargain. People have talked about developing these diplomatic international quote unquote clubs where if you join the club by committing to climate action, then you are entitled to certain technology and trade that other people who don't commit to those actions and deliver and join the club uh, do not get, right? And that has been proposed, I think, pretty compellingly as something that doesn't necessarily force people to do stuff, but if they don't do it, they're not going to get some other carrot that they would want, right? And then you have much more aggressive uh, international sanctions, right? Um, and so those are usually used for, for bad actors in the, in the political sphere, right? Maybe if you invade your neighbor or, you know, do something really nasty, kill your own population, what have you, um, you might get hit with international sanctions. There's no reason why we couldn't use those tools to achieve our climate goals. The problem is, even the quote unquote good guys don't necessarily have such a great story to tell and aren't necessarily doing that much better than the bad guys. And so because it's such a muddy space in terms of who's actually uh, doing their homework and not saying the dog ate their homework, the, I think those tools have not been used because no one, no one really is, is getting uh, an A and is the teacher's pet. But I mean, how important is China in the supply chain for renewables? Enormous, enormous. Now, there are different types of renewables. There is uh, There are solar panels, there are uh, wind turbines, there are batteries, there are the components of, of those different technologies, there's electric vehicles, there's the raw materials and the supply chain and the processing of those raw materials. Those are all part and parcel of the clean energy economy. Um, and China's role in those varies uh, depending on which of those particular things you look at. But overwhelmingly across that whole spectrum, China is the dominant supplier or manufacturer or um, uh, provider of, of primary or processed raw material such that they have a uh, stranglehold on many of these technologies globally, uh, both the supply chains and and often the the end products. Some of that is so, and that by stranglehold I mean often from sixty percent to upwards of ninety ninety five percent of the market. Uh, very very large uh, majorities to almost complete monopolies in in a lot of these categories. Sometimes in some cases, one could argue that. Uh, China's efforts have been completely above board, um, that they invested 20 years ago tens of billions of dollars in electric vehicles, in batteries, in, in, in green energy, and they are, are reaping the benefits of that farsightedness. They actually stole a lot of American intellectual property for most of that. So I don't know how much they invested. <laughs> there's, there's also the, the, the fact that they've gotten subsidies from government um, sometimes uh, in contravention of WTO rules that, and engaged in dumping, as we were already talking about, of, of, of subsidized products on other markets. There's also the fact that for many, many decades, one might argue uh, they're still doing it, China has basically ignored the local environmental consequences of this kind of manufacturing and processing, such that where these critical minerals are mined, you know, they're leached using these horrible acids and, uh, you know, they, it looks like a moonscape um, where they're mined and people are getting cancer and all these things. And, you know, China never really adopted environmental regulations that, that address that, unlike other countries. Right. I think that's a really important point because, you know, with all the focus on global warming, right, with this broad global carbon and, and to a degree methane emissions, sometimes you kind of lose focus on like these horrible things that are happening at the local level. And there's way more to the environment than just 
global temperature. There are many ways we're destroying the world. Yes. Uh, so as we diversify the ways in which we destroy yes. the planet, what are like what are some of the things that we're seeing in China that are more local uh, externalities? So now what, what you're saying is you're a champion of diversity, equity, inclusion for for pollution. I, I, yes. I like it. I like it. Right. Uh huh. Include um, as many ways as possible. <laughs> uh huh. So. So what are the biggest challenges we're seeing in China in terms of pollution outside of the, the carbon methane? So this issue is huge. This issue is enormous. Now, China gets some credit for getting a handle on their air pollution in eastern China, in some of the biggest cities, which used to have these smog days and and just absolutely horrific air quality that was really the worst in the world from like the 90s until I want to say five to 10 years ago. They've actually done a lot to improve air quality in that part of the country vis-a-vis um, -vis themselves and also vis-a-vis -vis other really polluted countries like India. But, but I hesitate to, I, I hasten to add, there has also been tremendous environmental degra degradation in terms of water quality, soil quality, and a lot of that environmental damage is long-term and not fixable by just closing down a coal plant. And so while the air may be somewhat cleaner, or in some cases a lot cleaner a lot of the time in certain cities, there are wide swaths of the country that are environmentally devastated, where the water is not drinkable, where it's not safe to consume the produce that's grown in the soil. And it's, it's a real problem. Uh, and China's not alone, of course, but having a, a repressive autocratic government that did not care about those things for, for decades meant that there was absolutely no pushback to that. And this economic growth at all costs model uh, has really had very, very dire consequences for the Chinese people, first and foremost. Although possibly it's a strategy because if you let all your elderly people die from cancer at an earlier age, you don't have to support such a big social safety net. I'm glad you're not president, Matt. <laughs> um, but you you made the point about uh, the impact of soft power on being able to get countries to actually take action. And I think the air apocalypses, as they were called, is a good example of that. Like that was such an internationally uh, black eye on China. Right. Like everyone who visits China. And I remember going. Or even to, seeing the right. pictures of it. Like it was a joke Just, people were talking yeah. about. And they changed a little so, bit. So how, how did China reduce air pollution in the major cities? Like I'm sure there was no horrible, horrible catch. There were a few different sources of those pollution of that kind of pollution that they they tackled um, to varying degrees, but more or less collectively. The most important was coal plants uh, within the city limits or very close to the cities. And so even if you're not parting with your beloved coal, if you at least move those smokestacks outside the city, that helps to address the problem to a certain degree. They also gradually shifted to uh, cleaner transportation fuels and to vehicles that have cleaner combustion. And of course, now we're seeing a transition to electric vehicles, which have no tailpipe uh, emissions at all. So that was a factor. You also, in the north of China, you know, around Beijing and other cities, had... Um, heating systems that were mostly rickety old, basically coal stoves and furnaces, such that you would get a lot of soot and air pollution from those uh, types of, of facilities. So even though the mass demolition of the hutongs in Beijing uh, had a lot of really unfortunate uh, impacts on people, on historical um, uh, patrimony and things like that. In some cases, those actions did modernize the building stock and allow them to move to cleaner, more modern uh, systems for for 
heating and, and energy at the building level. And so there was a lot of that as well. Well, I mean, at least the coal plants are out of the city, which doesn't reduce the larger impact, but at least there are fewer people exposed directly to that smog. Oh, for sure. There's no question that that's good. Although they may have substituted the uh, the health problems from air pollution uh, of the Beijingers to, uh, you know, the the uh, people in Anhui, right? Or, or, you know, some other poor interior province, right? Uh, so they haven't... Right. But, but as poor people are easier to forget about from their perspective. From, you from their perspective. The last trick. Yes. Their well, it's not my perspective. I know you, Matt. I know how you operate. Yeah. So it's a big problem, right? And there, there's a... The, I've looked at the, the number. I've read actually some, some interesting articles that show that for all the income inequality we have in the United States and more broadly in the West, um, the income inequality between urban and rural China is like two universes, right? You know, you have people who are earning, you know, at least before the recent economic crisis, salaries that are within spitting distance of, of um, living standards in the West. And then you have people in rural villages who are making pennies, right? And almost living in medieval conditions. That exists in other places as well, but it's very pronounced in many parts of China. And that is still true today. Well, so you mentioned the issues with water pollution uh, and the fact that a lot of the land, you can't eat the food that grows in the ground. Uh, I mean, that is a catastrophic problem for the Chinese Communist Party. But as you mentioned, it's not something that can be solved by closing a coal plant. Is there a way to solve that? I mean, you would think this would be motivating the Chinese Communist Party to make uh, more environment, to make some environmental regulations. But is this just a case where it's such a catastrophic thing they're facing that they're just trying to kick the can down the road as long as they can and just focus on the now? I'd say there are two parts to that problem. There's the old pollution that is already there, that's accumulated in the environment. And then there's the new pollution that's still coming into the environment from economic activity um, that's happening today. While a difficult problem, at least it is in theory solvable, you know, the, the new pollution. And that is investing in alternative technologies. It is transitioning people out of polluting industries. It is using government regulation and actually holding polluters accountable. Those are things that, while done imperfectly, have all happened in advanced developed countries. Now, when you have so much accumulated pollution already in the environment, you have what are basically the Chinese equivalent of the U.S. Superfund sites, where you have these massive concentrations of pollution that can make the land toxic and essentially unusable. And it takes massive investment to go back and try to clean it up. In some cases, it's just, for all practical purposes, impossible. I'm no expert on the exact composition of heavy metals in the soil of certain, inter, you know, landlocked Chinese provinces, but from what I've heard, the the contamination is is so bad, having accumulated over decades, that there is no near term fix for that. That they've really dug themselves a, a deep hole from an environmental perspective, and I don't know what the solution is to that. I mean, it's funny you compare it to Superfund sites, right? Because like the reason that the heavily polluted parts of the United States are called Superfund sites, like the you know old gas stations and all that, right? It's because there's a fund, a government fund that is designed specifically to help clean those things up so they can be, the land can be healed and it can be reused for, you know, residential or whatever, right? Does China have a Superfund or is it just like not really in their priorities? I am not aware of it. I think that they're still a, a middle-income country where 
funds for social services are spread pretty thin. I don't know of any middle income country that has invested significantly in environmental remediation. You have what's sometimes called the Kuznets curve, um, named after the same economist who invented the GDP metric, where you plot the pollution of countries over time as they become richer. And pollution starts low, and then it gets really bad during industrialization, and regulation doesn't keep up, and the, the technologies are polluting, and people don't care as much about the, the long-term environmental harm as the short-term economic benefit. And then as you transition into the ranks of the wealthy countries, people begin to prioritize environment and health and um, air quality and things like that. And you transition from a manufacturing economy to a services economy, and you have money to invest in environmental solutions, and the pollution comes back down, right? The OECD advanced industrial countries of the West have more or less traversed that entire curve. The middle income countries are by and large still stuck in the middle and are just polluting a lot and haven't gotten down the bottom side of that curve. And that's why many large middle-income countries, um, like you know the Indias and Brazils and South Africa's of the world, are among the worst polluters. And China is very much in that category. Right. But I mean, I suppose like the US and Western Europe aren't really helping when we are buying products manufactured in China, India, Brazil, and you know, importing them here, right? Well, that's part of how these Western countries have cut down on pollution by just exporting right. it. To... We're ex yeah, we're exporting the externalities of production. That is a hundred percent true, and and that is in many respects one of the dirty secrets of the environmental successes in the West. Is it's not like we necessarily solved the problem. In many cases, we exported the problem to poor countries who now pollute themselves instead of us uh, polluting ourselves. That's true for carbon emissions too, by the way. Not everyone subscribes to the national accounting approach that is commonly used for emissions. Because if you believe the premise that the emissions the U.S. Respons is responsible for is not what's inside our borders, it's what's embodied in the products that we consume, then you could make the case that it's actually the U.S. that's to blame, the U.S. consumers who are importing the, that, those products from, from China. Now, it's complicated. Right, but rather than blame consumers, wouldn't it make more sense to blame uh, government policy that allowed for this type of uh, buying cheap products from from poor countries that pollute? And also the U.S., like the large corporations like Walmart or whatever that have been lobbying the U.S. government to continue policies like I, this? I don't know. I've been hearing that the U.S. consumer is also responsible for all this inflation we've been having. So, You're right. Um, we should just blame like, you know, the common people yeah. for all this. No, I, I, I withdraw my statement. <laughs> well, look, there's these are hard problems. And in fact, there, this recognition that the production will often go to the jurisdiction with the weakest environmental rules or the weakest labor rules for that matter is why these environment and labor issues uh, have been negotiated into trade agreements in the last couple of decades in recognition of that fact that otherwise industry will just leave the U.S. and go to where regulation is lighter. And, and where wages are lower, but there's no protections for workers. So those, those are real, real things that people who care about these issues are, are trying to address, but it's hard. It's kind of like playing whack-a-mole. There's always a country out there with weaker environmental regulations. You have to respond to that and somehow enforce trade measures on them uh, to prevent those products from flooding into the country and displacing those that are more expensive because their manufacturers played by the rules. So it sounds like it's almost an unsolvable problem 
And a lot of the predictions put like the climate crisis at climaxing like now or in 10 years. So it doesn't seem like the solution comes before the catastrophe is what I'm hearing. So this come, you know, we've come full circle. This comes back to the cop and how you succeed in, in climate diplomacy. I think there are at least two critical elements, but let's start with two. You need to have political will. So you need the people to actually want it and reward their political leaders for it and not punish them. And it's one thing to say you want, you know, a, a clean climate, but if you keep buying the same stuff and voting the same way, then you're not actually acting your values, right? Now, the I'm, other... I'm sorry, I, I, I voted for the smog monster from Fern Gully for president. I, that was my mistake. I'm sorry. Well, maybe, maybe those are your values and, and I, and, and, you know, bravo you. So he was just so charismatic. I'm sorry. He had that song. Anyways, <laughs> please. I think that, that that's maybe a different podcast, right? Um, but anyhow, the other, the other factor, let me just throw this one in, um, um, is the need for these replacement technologies that are cost competitive in the long run. Under most circumstances, it's not realistic to expect people to pay more for something that they can get more cheaply. So you either have to enforce it with government policy or with taxes, or you need to find a substitute that's just better. And we are struggling with those two things right now. And, and they, 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 they mutually influence each other because when you have alternatives that are high quality and affordable and viable, then people are going to want them and they're going to support governments that pursue them. And when stuff is expensive, such that people are going to be unemployed or there's going to be a lot of inflation, if you pick the environmentally friendly solution, that's going to be really hard to get the public to support. And that is another way to encapsulate the quandary we're in on the climate front. I suppose I'd maybe would add a third thing, which is to possibly, and this might be totally out of line, but to possibly not let all these international climate agreements be done by, you know, these elite people who fly in on private jets to Dubai for a conference that's run by, you know, a guy in charge of one of the largest oil companies. Like maybe, maybe that's a problem. I think it's safe to say that the people flying on the private jets and getting the royalty checks from the oil companies are not likely those that are feeling the pinch of climate impacts the most. And if the people feeling the impacts of those climate impacts the most were running the world, we would have a different world. But we've, we haven't figured that one out either. And I guess, the, you know, you don't want the other extreme. Like you mentioned that uh, the Chinese Communist Party was able to tackle some of the air pollution in like the very specific areas of Beijing by like demolishing all the hutongs and evicting people and, you know, just the worst kind of go government overreach. You don't want that to be the solution that's forced upon everyone in the United States either. Yeah, I think that that analogy applies in some cases. In some cases, there are more, you know, fine grain approaches that aren't using a, you know, sledgehammer where you could use a, a scalpel. But those are often hard and it, they require a lot of iterative improvement of policy and uh, engagement with communities to make sure policies are actually benefiting them and perfection of technology. And, you know, you need, you need everything to work right in society to, to, to solve <laughs> these hard problems. Oh God, we're doomed. Well, I might like to end the, the podcast on an optimistic note since that, you know, didn't, doesn't seem like we're in a great situation, but, uh, just, just to give everyone a little bit of hope. Um, I saw somewhere on the internet that there is no climate crisis. The sun is just getting hotter, so maybe we're all fine. Eh? Well, uh, maybe I'll go put on my swim trunks and my sunglasses and just enjoy it, huh? Amen. <laughs>
Well, thank you very much for joining us and uh, dealing with all of the hot air that we emit on this podcast sometimes. Uh, yeah, it was very, very informative. Very, very interesting. Thank you very much. Yeah, well, thank you. This was fun. I'm glad that we sort of meandered around and caught a lot, a lot of topics. I thought that was fun. So hopefully it wasn't, was, it won't be too bewildering to your, to your viewers. All right. Yes. Once again, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. All right. Thank you, gentlemen. This was fun. You know, I just want to, I, that smog monster in Fern Gully really was charismatic. I was just thinking about how, how that is maybe the most memorable part of this podcast for me. Yeah. Yeah. I think it was Tim Curry oh. who did the voice. I'm not sure. He's, he does great voices. He, does. he really does. Yeah. He does. I also had to bite my tongue when he was talking about new pollution and like, cause I wanted to say that was one of my favorite Beck songs. Hmm. I, I didn't think he'd appreciate that. <laughs> I, I appreciate his tolerance for the many dumb things that we say. And by we, I mean me. No, 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 no. I, I had an interjection about Fern Gully. <laughs> I, I really had a line about how it's easy to forget about poor people. Oh, that's true. Man. You just hit your head on the <laughs> microphone. We're professionals. Uh, no, you had that nice thing about how specifically you knew what the language was changed to. That was a very big brain. Yeah, that's definitely something that I've always known about and not something I specifically had happened to look up this morning. You know, I like I really like how when Shelly's gone, it can just be us like encouraging each other and you know, it's very wholesome. It's, it's all the facial hair. Yeah, she doesn't bring us down. Yeah. She she sows discord. Yeah. Well, she will probably be back next week, so That's true. Yeah. No. Well. Anyways, thank thank you for watching. And once wait, this is the camera I'm looking at. Thank you for watching. I'm Chris Chappell. And I'm Matt Ganesta.